So through this deep dive series, we have been taking a look at how Bionicle sets play as a game, right? When you take a look back at 2001 and the masks involved, we've taken a look briefly at the Toa Mata as well as the Turaga, and I may touch on the McDonald's Matoran in their own little short video. But in today's video, we have to understand that 2001 was not the only year of Bionicle to have masks. In 2002, we got the Toa Nuva and the Borok. 2003 gave us the Borok Cal and the Rakshi. And so I wanted to look at those sets as well. I do, of course, plan to do a video on the Rahi as well, but that is going to be a longer form video just because there are five of them and there are also combination models which play drastically different from the first. Combination models may show up in their own video too, but let's go ahead and focus on the topic of this video, which is the Borak. If you guys are enjoying this content, my name is Skybird, and please be sure to subscribe. It really helps out. And yeah, without further ado, let's focus on the Borak. So, as we covered in previous videos, in 2001, Bionicle introduced us to these masks right here. And whenever you went to the store, honestly, to buy any one of these Toa Mata sets, if you were to buy only one of them, you had a pretty good likelihood of battling your friend and winning if they went to the store and also bought one set. Where I think the strategy for the Toa Mata comes in is mixing and matching pieces. Mixing masks that maybe are a little bit harder to hit because maybe they're a little bit smaller, or they have a different angle of approach, and mixing them with weapons with a heavier strike or better hook capabilities or what have you, right? So 2001 Bionicle requires a lot of strategy, in my opinion, where 2002 with the Borok, honestly, 2001 walked so that the Borok could not just run, but completely run away with the entire game. They are so much stronger than anything that the Toa could possibly do. When we take a look at the Borok, and I do have the Krana set off to the side here, but I'm going to show one of the functions here in a moment, so I'll put it in there in a second. When we take a look at the Borok, the main function of this model, the main attack of this model, is activated via this lever on the back. Pushing down on this lever is not only very satisfying, but it moves a gear, which that lever is directly built into, and interacts with these gears in the front. Those gears are of the same length as well, and so they are thus parallel to the body. So the head moves parallel to the body, giving you a decent amount of force. A rubber band on the back of the head also allows the head to snap back to its original position. When you take all of this into account, the weight of this head, the sheer size of the front of the model as well, this delivers probably what is arguably one of the strongest impacts that a Toa can take. I would definitely say it's on par at the very least with the Terakaba's punch, if not a bit stronger than that. And probably very similar, maybe not quite as strong as the Muaka or Kanera in terms of their bite. But the one thing to really focus on in this build here is at the front of this model. In fact, the entire design of this is very smooth overall. So while it is delivering a very good punch, there's not a whole lot on the head that can necessarily hook onto a mask. There are definitely these little cutaways, these little details at the base of the teeth there but outside of that you probably would want to get it here if you're trying to hook onto the mask at all and pull the mask off no where this succeeds is just brute force just hitting and smacking the mask over and over and over again it's not quite as effective as some other types of attacks but as you do it as fast as you can do it and this is capable of going pretty quick you're just going to basically bombard your opponent with attacks with this model and that works really well but this does have a secondary feature this is more or less something that plays in line with the story. So in the story, you could almost see this as a perk. But in reality, I like to think of it as a weakness. When pressing on the eye right here, the windscreen will eventually snap. It will give way, allowing the Krana to fly out. And it can fly out with such force that it actually goes a pretty good distance. In the story, this is seen as the Borok's way of actually launching the mask at the Toa to try to take control of them. But I, in the Bionicle game, like to see it as the way to properly de defeat the Borok. There are basically two attacks that the Borok are weak to. Direct strikes to that eye, which are difficult, because that eye is slightly rounded, it's hard to hit it with a good impact, and there it takes a pretty decent amount of force to actually get it to overcome the clasp, which is designed into this proprietary windscreen piece here. The second weakness of the Borok windscreen is this underhang right here. The windscreen itself is wider than the head by one module on each side, so this head is actually weak to uppercut type attacks. Unlike the Toa Mata, which are weak to a downward strike in most cases, 
with the Borak, you actually kind of want to hit them with an upward swing. The reason for that is because if, say, for example, you have a character like Gali with her hooks or Pohatu with his kick, if they can get up underneath this and actually push up on it, then it can release with pretty minimal force. Still take some, but notably less than a mask does. And there are obviously certain scenarios where you can hit it and it takes less force or more force just because generally these parts have a little bit of play in them. So you can kind of move them around a little bit. So sometimes you get a hit on there and it delivers enough force, but it doesn't quite overcome what's needed to actually pop it open. Other times you hit it barely, but the whole thing flips open just because, again, the design of those pieces. It's really interesting. It's really fascinating, in my opinion, but it's definitely something to take note of. So anytime you are fighting a Borok with another character that is not a Borok, you really want to aim for this lip right here and try to get underneath it and pull up on it. If you are battling a Borok with another Borok, though, then you can try to go for that eye strike because their heads weigh enough that striking in the eyes, literally trying to bash their heads together, can dislodge the Krana pretty easily. And I like that because this is exactly what I think LEGO would have had the intention for. Here's the thing. When we look at these sets, we know that they were on the shelf at roughly the same time. In 2002, the Borak were new, which meant many people were going to want to go out and get them, assuming that the demand is there, right? They're the new sets. They're the new thing on the block. Everybody's going to want them. They're the trendy item. And so you might go out and get one. Your friend might go out and get one. So it means that you're probably most likely to battle two Borak against each other. Whether or not Lego's story ever does that doesn't matter because kids are going to be kids and they're going to battle whatever they want. So if you get home and you have a Toa Mata built, sure, you might grab them off the shelf and try to battle a Borak. But more realistically, if you get home and your friend is also home or a sibling is home with you and you both have a Borak each, it's much more likely that's what you're going to be battling. So it's very clear that LEGO designed these with that idea in mind. that The Borak themselves are going to be battling each other. And with that sort of forward force, remember this head moves forward, right? It means that you get that forward attack against the eye, but the head does not only move forward. It also slightly moves down at the end of its arc, right? It lowers just a bit. It goes down. And that is actually important, too, because in that strike, you're not just hitting the eye from straight on, but you're hitting it with a slight downward force as well, which, again, can mean that you end up knocking an opponent's chrono out. And because of the design of this windscreen on the front here, it sort of funnels the head on an attack into these positions, right? It's slightly rounded at the top, meaning that any attack is either going to hit the top and bounce off or hit the top and deflect to one side or the other. And I think that's kind of the point with these. So my assumption is that these are designed first and foremost to battle other Borak as a toy, but you definitely can battle Toa and Toa can defeat them. You're just kind of at an unfair advantage because these Borak are much stronger in their attack against a Toa than a Toa is against a Borak. That said, though, in terms of strategy, what I have found works best with the Borak when battling the Toa and what I used to do as a kid was when I attacked, I would eject the head outward and slam down on the mask, right? So I would aim towards the mask, if not slightly high, and slam the model down. Because when I'm pushing on this, that head can't really go anywhere. And again, this is kind of where the most hooks on the model are. So it's very likely that if you slam down on the top of the mask, the part of the mask that is weakest, that you're going to knock the mask off. Whereas when I was playing with a Toa against a Borok, again, the strategy there is a lot more difficult. It's mostly reliant on strong uppercut type punches. So Galley is much more effective because of her shorter weapons, especially if you rotate the hooks facing upward. Onua is decently effective as well with his claws facing sideways because they can kind of grip onto the sides of the windscreen and pull it up. And uh, Pohatu with his kick can do a decent job, although because of the shape of his kicker weapons, they can also deflect on occasion. Liwa is okay at this game because the back of the axe at the very least still has a little nub of plastic that can get up underneath the windscreen lifted off the two weakest characters from my experience are Kopaka and Tahu because their blades are relatively smooth pretty small in terms of the surface area you're trying to contact that 
uh, windscreen width and because the angle of approach matters, right? If my uppercut is coming from an angle like this, it's going to be more effective than if the uppercut is coming from an angle like this because it's just flatter. It's more parallel to the ground, if that makes sense. Obviously, it's assuming that players are actually carrying their characters on the ground, which we know never happens, and that's not like it was an explicit rule, right? Were there even rules to play the mask game? No, I think it's an intuitive game, and that's what I like about it so much. It's very different from, like, the Glatorian game, for example, which, although I admire, that actually has a set of rules that go with it, and that can be a little bit, you know, annoying to deal with, right? Especially as kids. They just want to get into the gameplay, the fun stuff. So, with all of that said, what then would I recommend with the Borok? Well, if you were using the Borok and you did want to plant the character on the ground, then you're basically never going to defeat a Toa because this head is never going to go high enough. Instead, you would need to bring the legs back to get a sort of upward strike. But as we discussed in previous videos, the bottom of the masks from 2001 are actually about their strongest point. A strike from the bottom is very hard to get to knock a mask off. So the Borok are technically weaker than the Toa if the Toa and the Borok are on the same playing field. If you glued their feet to the ground and said, okay, they cannot leave the ground in any way, then in that case, I don't want to say weaker. Maybe, let me rephrase that. They're just at a disadvantage. I still think they absolutely could defeat the Toa. And in that case, I think their strength comes from more of a sideways strike because remember, this head is massive. So if it can't knock the mask off from hitting it from below, maybe it can strike it from the side, right? Similar to how I would just slam the head down on a character because who cares about the function, right? The functions on these sets at the end of the day are really fun. And we also know that the Borak Va were a creation that was uh, out and available back in 2002 as well. Though these are not really something I consider with the mask game, mostly because that Krana is entirely unprotected. What I would have liked to have seen from the Borak Va is for them to include the same rubber band that's included with the Turaga and for that rubber band to go down inside of these little gaps here to hold the Krana in place. It's not going to work on everything, of course, and it's not designed to hold the Krana permanently, but rather just to secure it so that maybe in a hit or two hits or three hits, that Krana can eventually fall out. But as we know, that is the part you hold as well. And if you're holding onto the Krana when you're using an attack, you basically have an unfair advantage. It'd be like using a Turaga, but then attacking by holding his mask. How are they supposed to knock the mask off if your attacks are like this? You know, they, they can't. You're blocking it, right? So, yeah, the Borak Va are not the most effective when it comes to playing the, the mask game. You can either see them as just kind of a novelty, um, but not really something that actually plays the game, or just the easiest thing to defeat in the world. Because, yeah, they, um, they just don't really have anything to protect their masks, and the masks slip out and fall out all the time. So, with that said, the Borak Va do have one little feature, though, where you can actually tilt the head down and flick the Krana out like a little catapult, very similar to the Borak themselves. And that is definitely something you can do, which is often why I don't use the weapon in the swinging arm, but rather have the swinging arm empty. Like I said, I don't plan on ever playing the mass game with these characters. And so this is a much more effective little catapult. And then you could play a different type of game where maybe you have to hit the opponent's mask with your Krana or something. And if you hit their mask, you win. If you don't hit their mask or you miss their mask, you lose or whatever, right? The way that me and a friend used to play this game before I end this video, when we were kids, and the reason I grabbed Parak for this video was because what we would do is we also played Pokemon cards. At the same time, we had a friend that worked at a card shop all the way back then. And so we used to get a ton, 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 ton of duplicate cards. And if you've ever played Pokemon cards, you know that they have prizes in that game, right? We just took that idea and shoved it into Bionicle. Basically, what we did, if I can remember correctly, is we'd pull out about 12 cards each. So I'd go through, shuffle through this little stack of cards this big, pick out 12 that I thought were kind of cool. They would do the same thing, right? And then we of those 12, we'd mix them all together, get 24 cards, but then we would pull out just six, right? So it's somewhat randomized. And then the idea was we would basically play the game and every time you knocked off a mask, you got to collect a card. Borok were harder, so we collected two cards when a Borok was defeated. That was basically our thing. And I picked Parak because that was the one I always traditionally used because as far as I can recall, he was my first Borak anyway, but also because I do distinctly remember defeating the Exotoa in this game as well. The Exotoa is definitely its own case. Maybe going to save that one for its own video. 
With all that being said, though, that's pretty much it for this one. If you did enjoy the video, make sure to leave a like and subscribe. It does really help the channel out and it gets us that much closer to 3000 subscribers, which is insane to think about. And of course, thank you if you are subscribed. You can also join the conversation down in the comments below. What are your thoughts on the Borak? Do you see them as too strong to verse the Toa Mata or do they have some disadvantages that maybe I overlooked? And of course, as always, you can let me know and carry on that conversation further over on Discord, Instagram, or Patreon if you want to help support the channel and get some perks. And as I briefly mentioned in the other videos, yes, technically, the Borak can also cover their head. So they do have that. All right, I'll see you all in the next one. Take care.